Chapter 19 The Ninja The siege of Ivermuir Castle was in its second week. No attack had yet been made, nor any a defender had sallied forth. The ring around the fortress was now so solid that no one could escape or break through with messages. We knew that the besieged had water enough, there were good wells inside. It would not be from thirst, but from hunger that the castle would fall. Wadakonske and I were kept busy distributing rice and millet to the soldiers. They had been divided into three groups, and each in turn was given a ration that would last up to three days. That meant that every morning, just after sunrise, we served out grain. The food was scanty enough, the soldiers made raiding parties on neighboring farms and villages to augment it. Often some soldier would have his ration stolen by someone hungry enough to rob a friend. Then he would come complaining to, of his hard luck to us. When I thought it a real hardship, I would sometimes manage to give him a little, at the same time making him promise to keep it a secret. I feared that once it became known I could be cajoled into giving extra rations, the whole army, whole army would come begging. This was not our only function. After all, the Kanitatai carried more, provisions of, more than provisions of food. A foot soldier who had been in many battles and experienced many sieges was in charge of the grappling irons and saw it to it that the ropes attached to them were securely tied. To be able to swing an iron up across the wall took not only great strength but also skill, and not everyone could do it. Once the iron hook was caught, one has to be quick to climb up the rope for the defenders try to cut the rope and send you sprawling down again. These grappling irons, ropes, and all extra weapons were in our charge. We had made a depot for all our stores, but unfortunately the only houses nearby had been burned by troops too eager to show their valor. What worried Watakonske more than anything else was the possibility of rain, so he had some makeshift huts made to store the grain. These would not have kept out a downpour, but so far we had been lucky and had no rain. In a way, I had come to like being with the Konitatai rather than being an ordinary samurai. As Yoshiroki had said, I would have been merely one of many, and that one of the youngest, whom everyone surely would have felt a right to order about. I was growing up fast. Each day, something new, uh, each day taught me something new about men and how to handle them. Watakonsuke was a good teacher. He was ever patient, but at the same time immovable when he thought himself in the right. Many of the Konitatai thought him a hard master, but in truth, he has often defended them against others. But he was a proud man and neither joked nor even talked to the luckless farmers who made up our men, except to give them orders. He was concerned about them in the same way that he was about the horses. Without the beasts to carry the packs, there could be no army, and so it was important that the horses and men were in a condition to carry out their tasks. To Watakonsuke, a samurai and a farmer were so different that he could never for a moment think of comparing them. He expected the present to work, to labor until he was exhausted, but he did not demand from him the same loyalty he expected from his own kind. If a farmer in the Konitatai had found life too hard to bear, Konsuke would not have thought it strange if he had drowned himself or hanged himself from a tree. But if the luckless one should decide to end his life by imitating a samurai and committing seppuku according to the sacred rituals, Konsuke would have, been considered, uh, Konsuke would have considered such an action an intolerable insult to his honor. I did not see Yoshitoki often. When I was free, it was mostly at night, and he would often have to—he would often have to go stand watch somewhere. But one evening, we managed to be together. Watakonsuke, who liked his sake enough that he hardly ever showed he had been drinking, had a large gourd filled with his life-giving water. I had boiled some rice, so there were rice balls to eat. We sat near the fire, for it was now the eleventh month, and the nights in the mountains were cold. The sky was clear and the moon nearly full. It was a proper moon viewing party. Flushed from the sake and more daring than I was usually, I declaimed the poem I had made a few nights before, and to my surprise, Konsuke complimented me on it. I had not known that he liked poetry. He quoted a poem about the moon. Whether it was his own or not, I am not sure. I had suspected it had been composed by a woman, and after the old warrior recited it, he grew silent, as if he were traveling back through his life to some memory in the past. It was nearly the hour of the rat when a guest joined our little party. In the middle of the night, most of those who were not on guard duty were asleep, and all the world was quiet. We did not notice the newcomer, so silently and stealthily did he creep into our circle. It was not until we spoke that we saw the black-clad creature. Konsuke, have you a little sake for our friend? For a friend, rather? His voice was thin, and he sat there by the fire. He reminded, more, he reminded me more of anything than a bat. 
Konsuke shook the gourd and handed it silently to our stranger. The, the guest repeated his host's movement, shaking the gourd first as if to make sure there was indeed sake in it. He took a long drink, after which he wiped his lips with his hand and returned the gourd to the Konsuke. Where have you come from? my captain asked. With a movement of his head, the ma uh, man clad in black indicated the mountain and the castle behind him. He is a ninja, I thought as I scrutinized the man. He did not wear a sword, but a short dagger in his sash and some other weapon I could not recognize. It was difficult to see as he was wearing a black or dark blue hunting jacket that almost covered it. And what was it like? I tried to guess from the Konsuke's face how much or how little he liked the stranger. Some people dislike ninjas and do not consider them proper samurai. I rather suspected this would be my captain's opinion. His face was turned toward the spy, but his countenance was as stony as when people asked more for more rice than they were entitled to. Lord Toyama is dead. The ninja held his hand out towards uh, Konsuke, who silently passed the gourd back to him. This indeed was news. The, government, the governor of Iwamura Castle was no more, could not help but aid our cause. He died one week before we came. A fever took it. Again the ninja drank. This time at an odd Konsuke, he handed the gourd to me. I took a sip. There was little left, and I handed it to Yoshitoki. He held it in his hand as he looked spellbound at the ninja. I would not have dared, he told me later. To fight openly, yes, but to creep it like a shadow in the night, no, I could not have done it. Who governs the castle now, Konsuke had, uh, held out his hand to Yoshitoki, who handed him the gourd without drinking from it. Lady Toyama. The ninja grinned, and in the moonlight his teeth gleamed. They were not painted black. Oh, there was some other captain in command, but he would not dare issue an order without a nod from Lady Toyama first. Konsuke frowned. I could not help but thinking to myself, he does not approve. Why is this woman so obeyed, he asked. There runs, in the same, uh, there runs the same blood in her as in Oda Nobunaga. Again the ninja grinned. She is his aunt, but I think a few years younger than her nephew. I held out a rice ball to our guest. He took it and popped it into his mouth. Oda Nobunaga is a handsome man. What is she like? Konsuke held out the gourd to the ninja. He took it, pausing for a moment while he swallowed the last of the rice and then emptied the gourd before he spoke. I did not see her, but all of that family are handsome. They told me she is very beautiful. Some thirty-odd times she has seen the snow of Mount Fuji melting in the spring. How did you get in the castle? Yoshiroki asked timidly, more awestruck than usual for him. When the poor farmers rushed into the castle in order to escape the murdering Kai army, there was an old man among them more wretched than the rest. The ninja made a sudden movement and turned towards Yoshitoki. Then his face changed. Suddenly he became old and his eyes took on the vacant look of one who has outlived his reason. It lasted only the briefest of moments. Then he laughed and slapped his thigh. It is magic, I thought, and wondered if he were indeed human. Could he be a badger or a demon? I looked at my captain, but its face was its usual stone, stony expression. The ninja handed him the empty gourd, and then he rose and bows, bowed deeply. The old samurai acknowledged this by a mere inclination of his head. As the ninja swal was swallowed up by the knight, Konsuke took to the gourd and threw it behind him as if he would never use it again. Who was he? Yoshikoki asked. Where did he come from? From Sagami, I think. Watakonsuke stirred the fire. I think he is called Iatsugu. I don't know his family name. The stick the old samurai was using to poke the fire had caught fire itself, and he held it up for a moment like a torch. Who knows whether that is really his name. It could also be something else. A ninja does not need a name. Lord Takeda uses many ninjas. I have seen them in Kofuchu. Having guessed that Konsuke did not, li did not like the ninja, Yoshiroki was careful not to point out that Lord Akiyama also used them. How can one trust a man who lives by treachery? Watakonsuke threw the smoldering stick into the fire. They may be useful. Certainly, it is important news that Lord Toyama is dead, he admitted grudgingly. They are very brave, Yoshidiki stretched himself. Brave? Konsuke nodded as if he were answering his own question. Yes, they are brave, I suppose, but they are also born traitors. Every ninja has had many masters. They serve for... Watakonsuke sped out the last word, gold and then rose as if he no longer wanted to discuss the subject, and lumbered off into the night like a tired old badger going home to his cave. <laughs>